Hi, it's Lindley Yaz, and welcome to another episode of Truth Hunters, because then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So thank you once again for joining me here at my fire pit, and we're going to sit here out under the stars on a summer night. It's actually kind of a really mild, nice summer evening, so it's perfect. So we're going to sit out here and just talk about the things of the Lord, talk about the Bible, and I do have one particular scripture in mind I want to share with you. It comes from James chapter 2, and it's about works, because I'm constantly hearing people when you talk about anything to do with works and producing the fruit, they like to say, oh, you're teaching works and all of this. Well, works are part of our salvation. They go hand in hand. So when Paul is talking to the church in his letter, he specifically says that for by grace are you saved through faith. Now faith does not mean what you've been taught. Faith means obedience, fidelity, and trust. Obedience, fidelity, and trust. So when it says by grace are you saved through faith, through obedience, fidelity, and trust, or faithfulness, not of works, lest any man should boast. What it's referring to is a person doesn't go to heaven just because they're a good person. Without a covenant that is established through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, one cannot go to heaven just by works alone. Now, Jesus Christ repetitively makes it clear in the New Testament that you must produce the fruit. It specifically says that any tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then he says, and it's actually in the same passage I just quoted, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many shall say to me on that day, I did miracles in your name. I healed people in your name. I cast out devils in your name. But then I will say to you, get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Then he goes on to talk about the good trees that bear good fruit, the bad trees bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. You shall know them by their fruit. And then he says that every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What's he referring to there? Well, we just like to say, oh, he's just referring to hell. Well, what Jesus is talking about, if you think about what the definition of circumcise means, it means to cut away, it means to destroy, cut off, okay, and then thrown into the fire. Well, there are two fires in the Bible. There's the fire of the Holy Spirit and there's the fire of God's wrath. So when it tells us that it anyone that does not bear good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. It's referring to God purifying you and cutting away your fleshly sinful nature and cleansing you through the fires of God. Now, Peter talked about those same fires. He said, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that you're going through as if something strange was happening to you, like the fiery trial, God's wrath. But Peter warns that it is God cleansing you and purifying you. So when Jesus says any tree that does not bear good fruit. Now it's also important that you understand a tree in the Bible is representing a leader, a teacher, a pastor, and so on and so forth. Okay, that is what a tree represents. So any teacher or pastor or evangelist or whatever that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
In other words, God is going to come after you and purify you through his fires in order to consecrate you and destroy the flesh nature. Because when we're not producing the fruit, we are in the flesh nature. Now, that verse also is for all of us, because even as a believer, even if you're not a teacher, if you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit, you will be cut down. In other words, God is going to cut away that flesh nature and destroy it in you, purge you of the ways of the flesh. So that's very important to understand. So we are to produce the good fruit. The church today doesn't like to focus on that. They like to focus on hyper grace. They like to focus on all of these false teachings. This once saved, always saved, hyper grace, uh, name it and claim it. And all of these other messages that are not at all what the Bible actually teaches. So the Bible over and over talks about producing the fruit. Jesus over and over talks about producing the fruit. He even said, understand the parable of the fig tree. So let's look at James chapter 2 and see what it says about producing the fruit or works rather. All right, so let's have a look, a close look at James chapter 2 beginning with verse 8. It says, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So let's go ahead and back up to... Verse 11, it says, for he who said, do not commit adultery also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, Jesus actually emphasized the Ten Commandments. Not only did he emphasize them, he magnified them. He gave us the spiritual connotation of the Ten Commandments. For example, do not commit adultery. We know adultery has to do with married people engaging in sexual activities. However, adultery in the Bible also is referenced to adultery against God, meaning you are cheating on God with the devil. You're living in the flesh. You're apostatizing the faith. You're committing idolatry. Okay, so adultery against God. Murder. What is the spiritual connotation of murder? When someone misleads the people with false teachings, leading them to an antichrist Jesus. An antichrist Jesus simply means instead of Jesus Christ. Antichrist, instead of. So instead of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Okay? So it's a flesh made Jesus. Flesh made. Okay? He's not the Jesus of the Bible, he's the Jesus that appeals to our flesh. He's the Jesus that just is gonna give you a little slap on the hand if you live in sin. That's the Jesus Christ that is taught today and that's not the Jesus Christ of the Holy Bible. Sadly, a lot of people argue that point. They argue everything that I'm teaching straight out of the Bible because they don't know the Bible. They're spoon fed the Bible by false teachers who are very crafty at blending the truth with the lies to make it sound like it's the truth. And that's why I encourage all of you out there watching this video to search the scriptures for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. You need to get in there and do some research for yourself. Now, if your eternity is not important to you and you're going to just gamble it by playing a game of spiritual Russian roulette, 
all right, by trusting all these teachers or trusting your grandparents or trusting your parents or trusting your best friend or your favorite pastor, well, then that is totally up to you and you have a right to do that. However, once everything is said and done, it'll be too late for you. So you really need to get in and study the word of God for yourself. Examine it closely. Be like a Berean. So back to what I was saying, how do you commit spiritual murder? Like I said, you lead people astray by teaching them false things. Now, even those of you who are not teachers can do that because what do you do? You go out and share the gospel with people and you're sharing what has been taught to you or somebody comes and asks you a biblical question. They're seeking advice because they know you're a Christian. Okay, and you give them an answer that you believe to be true, but because you've not studied the word of God for yourself deeply and examined it, you are actually leading them astray. That is spiritual murder because you're leading people to a false Jesus and a false salvation and a false covenant, which is taking the name of the Lord in vain. Name meaning mark, memorial, monument, mark, the mark of God, the seal of our salvation, the Holy Spirit. In vain, meaningless, empty, untrue, deceptive. All right, very important. So let's continue reviewing this passage. It says, For judgment, verse 13, will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, what is the biblical definition of mercy? It says kindness or goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted. Kindness or goodwill toward the miserable and the afflicted. Joined with the desire to help them of men towards men to exercise the virtue of mercy. Show one self merciful of God towards men and general providence. The mercy and clemency of God in providing an offering to men's salvation by Christ. The mercy of Christ, whereby at his return to judgment, he will bless true Christians with eternal life. It also says compassion, human or divine, tender mercy. So there is the definition of mercy to show kindness to someone who is afflicted, miserable, in torment, someone who is sick or diseased or whatever, or to anybody really. Like if you show mercy to someone who has done you wrong and maybe what they did was just horrible, but you show them mercy anyways and kindness and compassion and love. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Let's find out what works is defined as in Greek. It says deed doing labor or work effort or occupation business employment that which anyone is occupied that which one undertakes to do enterprise undertaking any product whatever anything accomplished by hand art industry or mind an act a deed a thing done the idea of working is emphasized in up to that which is less than work Okay, so that is what works means. So it's the things that we do. Okay, the things that we do. Now, if you need a better interpretation of that, we can go when I'm done sharing this with you and we'll look at the fruit of the spirit because fruit of the spirit and the works are basically the same thing. So what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, remember obedience, fidelity, and trust, faithfulness, but he has no works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. In other words, if you're saying I'm a Christian, but you are not producing any of the fruit or doing any of the good works, then basically your faith or obedience, fidelity, and trust, your faith and faithfulness to God is as nothing. It's dead. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So you say, oh, I'm a believer. Anybody can say they're a believer. Even the demons believe. But where are your works? Where is your faith? It says you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now let's look at the word believed. Okay, believe. To think to be true, to be persuaded, to credit, to place confidence in, to credit, have confidence. But it also says to entrust a thing to one, his fidelity, to be entrusted with a thing. So fidelity, and then it is rooted in a Greek word. That means a conviction of the truth, persuasion, conviction of the truth of anything, belief, Respecting man's relationship to God, divine things, relating to God, relating to Christ, a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah. It also means fidelity and faithfulness. The character of one who can be relied on, fidelity and faithfulness. And then that is rooted in a Greek word that means to convince by argument. So how are you going to convince people? about God or that you're a believer if you just say I'm a believer but you have no evidence it says agree assure believe have confidence to persuade to induce one by words to believe to make friends to win one's favor to tranquilize to persuade unto to move or induce one to persuasion to be persuaded to believe to listen to, to obey. Believe and the word faith mean fidelity, faithfulness, obedience, trust. And they also mean to listen, to obey, to yield to, to comply with, to trust, to have confidence, to be confident. That is the word believe. Okay, I'm sorry that other people aren't teaching you this. But the name it, claim it, church of today has taught you lies about what believe and faith actually mean. So when Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He was telling us we need to obey him. And when he says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted or cast into the sea and it would obey you. He's talking about if you even had just a little bit of obedience, fidelity, faithfulness, obedience to me, then it would be uprooted and cast into the sea. So let's see where we left off. It says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. How is that? Well, because if you are obeying Jesus Christ, if you're faithful to him, fidelity, obedience, trust to obey, faithfulness, belief, then you're automatically going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to have works because you're obeying the Lord and you're doing what He says. So how can you be faithful if you're not producing the fruit of the Spirit or having any works? So now let's take a look at, I believe it's Galatians. Yes, Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 19. It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, 
carousing and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice, practice, okay? It means you do this regularly, habitually. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you could say, I'm a Christian all you want, but if you practice those things, no matter what you say or what you think, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. But the fruit of the spirit, and it's a capital S there, the Holy Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, Yeshua, then you have crucified your flesh, put it to death. What does crucify mean? To impale, to extinguish, subdue, to subdue the passion or selfishness. See, everything about the end is about self. To crucify, to stake, drive down stakes, to fortify with driven stakes, to pelicide, to crucify, to crucify the flesh, destroy its power utterly. The nature of the figure implying that the destruction is attended with intense pain. So the destruction is attended with intense pain. Now that's rooted in a word. This says a stake or post a pole or cross as an instrument of capital punishment, figuratively exposure to death that is self-denial. By implication, the atonement of Christ, the cross, self-denial, self-denial. What's the opposite of self-denial? Selfish. Just like you see in the world today, everything is about self. So, an upright stake, a pointed one, used as such fences or palisades. And of course, we're reminded of the crucifixion that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, underwent. Now, part of the word comes from the base of this here. Let's see what this says. It says to stand, to abide, to appoint, to be set up, to make, to stand, to place or put or set up, to be established. To make firm, fix, or establish. So, putting to death the ways of the flesh, crucifying the flesh, is how we are established in our covenant with the Lord. To be kept intact. To sustain, to uphold, or sustain the authority or force of anything. To set or place in a balance. Think of, oh, what seal is it? I think it's the third seal, but I could be wrong. The one with the balances. To weigh money, to stand, to stand by or near, to continue. Now, what does it say about the devil? It talks about when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the place where he ought not to be. It's talking about the heart standing the word stand in Greek means exactly what I just read to you, to be established, fixed, set in place. Where is he standing where he ought not to be? In the heart of God's people. That is the place where he ought not to be, but yet he is there. It's a spirit. It is the Antichrist spirit. Antichrist. Choosing the flesh over Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and this flesh made Jesus Christ that is taught today. So my friends, the things I'm teaching you straight out of the Bible are the things Satan does not want you to know about. In fact, Satan has spent many, 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 many generations slowly over time trickling all these lies and deceptions into the teachings of the Bible because what happened? He went off to destruction. He went off to destruction to destroy what? The church. Does it talk about a building? Is that what it means? No. We are the temples. We are the stones. All of us together make up the whole temple. 
all right, with Jesus Christ Yeshua as the chief cornerstone. And what's so exciting, if you really know the truth, is that the Bible says that the Antichrist would be revealed and then that would be right before Yeshua HaMashiach comes back. So the Antichrist is revealed. The temple of the Antichrist. Okay, you guys are all familiar with, oh, we're the body of Christ. With Jesus Christ as the head, right? Well, then why is it so hard for you to accept that Satan, just like the body of Christ, has a body as well? It's the body of the Antichrist with Satan as his head. But what is the body of the Antichrist? It's God's people living in apostasy who have made Satan the head of the church. That's why you see the two witnesses. Now keep in mind, there's four witnesses. You have two olive trees and two lampstands in Revelation chapter 11. The olive tree is God's people, Israel, meaning those of us who are his people who are scattered. Okay, and then Jesus Christ is the lampstand. Well, what happens in his death and resurrection are a prophecy of this. Well, the church puts Jesus Christ to death spiritually, just as you saw the church of his day do to him. Back when Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead. Ah, raised from the dead. Hopefulness here. All right, so the first set of witnesses, okay, the first olive tree and lampstand was the early church who had Jesus Christ as its head. But then Satan goes off to destruction. He comes up out of the abyss and makes war with them and overcomes them and kills them. Now, right before he overcomes them and kills them, you see that they have all the power of the Holy Spirit. But then he overcomes them and puts them to death spiritually. All right. So then you all of a sudden see by the end of it, you see them raising to their feet, standing. We just looked over that word, what that means to be set up and established. You see Jesus Christ, Yeshua saying, come up here. That represents Jesus teaching his teachers the truth again, just as he told Moses to come up here to the mountain, come up here. Where did Moses get taught by God? On the mountain. Okay. He said, come up here. So He's teaching his people the truth. And then all of a sudden it says 7,000 people are killed. There's a great earthquake, which means a great shaking of the mind, a disturbance in the mind of God's people. Their eyes are beginning to open. They're waking up to the truth. They're disturbed suddenly by their own sin, their own sinful nature. They're realizing the truth. And then all of a sudden, 7,000 people are killed, and it says the rest gave glory to God. Now, why are people giving glory to God as 7,000 people are killed? Well, the church has taught us that there's literally a bunch of people that get killed, all the evil people of the world, and God's people are giving glory. Well, that opposes the true teachings of the Bible. The Bible says we're not supposed to glory over the death or the suffering of our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The 7,000 people who just got killed are a large number of people right at the seventh day or the start of the 7,000th millennia who have just repented and put to death the flesh. John used the number 7,000 to represent or symbolize the start of the seventh day, the start of the 7,000th millennia. The rest, the word rest in Greek means remaining, the remnant. Okay. Those who were already walking with the Lord and who have put to death the flesh are giving glory to God because a large number of people, the final amount of people God has been waiting for to be sealed by his Holy Spirit have just repented and put to death the flesh. That's what that means. And now all of a sudden you see heaven opening up, you see the Ark of the Covenant coming out. That's because Jesus is now being put back in place or set up or established as the head of the church again. When you see in the Bible, it talks about Jesus Christ coming on the clouds 
with power and glory. The word cloud in Greek means a multitude or a throng or a multitude. Jesus Christ coming on the clouds is referring to his people who have truly repented, who have truly been consecrated and purged of the flesh nature, purged of sin. God has returned the power of the Holy Spirit to them. And the whole world is witnessing these great miracles they're doing with power and glory coming on the clouds. Then what happens after that? Then Jesus Christ actually returns. So that's where we're at. We're in the season of producing the fruit. Jesus said, understand the parable of the fig tree. We have to produce the fruit. What does it say about the woman in Revelation 12? It says she is in great pain and labor. Great pain and labor. It's very difficult. It's very hard. It's very painful because God is purging us of our flesh. What does it say in Revelation 17? It talks about the harlot being consumed with fire, burned up with fire, and the birds eating her flesh. That's God's people who've been living in apostasy, being purged and purified by the fires of God. And God is using Satan and the kingdom of hell, the sword, look up sword in Hebrew, destruction, wound, so on and so forth. He's using the kingdom of hell to purge us and purify us of the sinful nature in order to consume our flesh. That's why you see the birds, which represent the kingdom of hell, eating the flesh. So very interesting. It's quite simple. When you really clear your mind of the false teachings and let God take you through his word deeply. God did not intend for his word to be so difficult, so confusing or anything like that for us to understand. He made it for the average person to understand. The reason why it's so confusing and difficult for us is because that is a trick of Satan himself. Because Satan has wanted us to rely on other people to teach it to us so that he could deceive us. So you have most everyone being spoon fed by teachers, false teachers that is, Spoon-fed the word of God because they're too afraid to study it for themselves. They're too afraid to study the book of Revelation because these false teachers have made Revelation so complex and so confusing. I mean, my goodness, you have to basically be a scholar with a bachelor's degree or a doctor's degree in something, history and all these other things to understand it. And that is just not true. That's not what it is about. It is symbolic. It is written in code to hide its message from the enemy. That is what apocalyptic writing style was all about. John wrote it using code or symbolism in order that the message would be hidden from the enemy. But guess what? God is now shining the light on the truth of what it means. He wants us all to know because he wants us to repent because we are at the last hour and the time to repent the time to really get on your hands and knees before the lord in humility and confess your sins and plead with him to give you a new heart and a new mind one that is like jesus christ to just really cleanse you of your sin to focus on your own sin and your own heart and just plead with the Lord to deliver you from your own sin. That is so vital. That time is right now. Because eventually God is going to return the power of his spirit to his people. And we are going to be doing great and mighty things before the eyes of all the world. Aren't you excited? It's time to get excited about that. The sooner that we repent, truly repent. The sooner we produce the fruit, the sooner we can see great things. The sooner we can do great things, great and mighty things, just like Jesus Christ himself did. We will be the ones God uses as his instruments, his tools to raise the dead, heal the sick, make the blind to see, and do all the wonderful things 
Jesus promised that we would do. So be very excited. These are exciting times. Look up because our redemption draws near. We're going to say a prayer, but first, before we begin the prayer, just stay with me for a brief moment. I have to remind you all that I am 100% viewer supported. I rely on your support in order to continue sharing the truth with people all over the world. The Bible does indeed say that a worker is worthy of their wages, that we are to support the teachers and preachers of the truth of God's word. So if you're blessed by these messages and you feel led or moved to support what I'm trying to do to help people to know the truth, to help people experience true salvation and get closer to the Lord, then please consider giving a gift to this ministry. I am in desperate need for your support. I'm not looking to get rich. I'm just looking to get by. And this is what I do full time. I spend many hours studying the word of God making these videos, putting them out for you, because I want you to know the absolute truth of God's word. Thank you to those of you who have been sowing into this ministry. I genuinely appreciate you. Thank you for all my Patreons. I appreciate you as well. Thank you so much and God bless all of you. I know who you are and I can't thank you enough. And more importantly, God knows who you are. Also, I do rely on you guys to share these videos. I'm shadow banned horribly and censored. People are unsubscribed by the thousands. So I rely on you guys to share these videos everywhere that you can. Don't forget to subscribe to my new YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash at truth hunter show, youtube.com slash at truth hunter show. And this is very, very important. When you subscribe, you need to click the bell. When you click the bell, a drop down menu comes up. You need to select to receive the notifications. If you do not do that, it will default to nothing unless they've changed it since the last time I've looked. So that is very important. And I'm asking all of you who have already subscribed to my new YouTube channel to please go back and double check because something's going on with the new channel now where I'm uploading videos. I have over 700 subscribers and the videos are suddenly hardly getting any views. All right, well, that's about it. Thank you again. I genuinely appreciate all of you. Let's go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes and let's pray. And as we pray, let's give the Lord thanks. Even if we're going through suffering, even if we're going through trials and tribulation, let's offer up the sacrifice of praise. Father God, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you, Father, that those who have been given ears to hear and eyes to see will hear this message with their whole heart, Lord. I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you are gathering us together in your word and the truth Lord, and that you will return the power of your spirit to us, Father. I thank you, Lord God Almighty, that although we are suffering for this moment, Lord, that we are all going through all sorts of different hells in our own life, Father, that soon, very soon, our deliverance comes. Lord, I thank you and praise you that we shall see our loved ones again, Father, soon. Lord, and most of all, we shall see your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, in all his glory and in all of his power. And we will be part of great things, Father. We just want to please you, Lord. We want to please you in everything that we do, Lord. Let our lips do service to you, Father. Let our lips speak only the truth, Father. I just thank you, Lord. I thank you that maybe some teachers who are misinformed, Lord, and have been teaching things that aren't totally true, Lord, that their eyes will be open, that they will hear this message, Father. Lord, I pray that you put the passion and the hunger for your truth in each and every one's heart, Lord, that's listening to this message. Father, I also thank you and praise you that there are people listening to this message, Lord, and you will lay it on their heart to help support what I'm trying to do, Father, that they will just begin to support me, Lord, that I can just continue sharing the truth with people 
all over the world. And I pray also that you get these videos out, Lord, to those who need to hear it. I praise you and I thank you, Lord. Just give us hope, give us strength. Help us to press on, Lord, in these battles that we go through. Lord, just give us the strength, Father, to keep pressing on, Lord, in you, for you, and through you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray, amen. And amen. Let's produce the fruit. Love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Have mercy and compassion on others. Get the hatred out of your heart. Remember less of you and more of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. In everything that you do, everything that you speak, everything that you think about each and every day. Remember that Yeshua sees and hears everything that you do. Imagine him right there with you in your presence. He really is there. But you've got to really remember that and ask yourself, is this what he would do? Should I do this? Is this what would please the Lord that I think about? What are these things I'm thinking about? Are they things that are pleasing to God? Are they things that are going to help me to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Are they things that God is going to use to help me to produce? If they are not things that you should be doing as a believer, then you need to really take it to the Lord. Pray about it. Seek his face. Pray about it. Begin to look within your own heart. Quit focusing on everybody else. Quit focusing on this outward appearance that others have. Quit focusing on the things of the world. God knows our hearts. God is the only one that knows our heart. We are to focus on the fruit that is being produced by others and mainly ourselves so that we are producing the fruit. Jesus Christ himself said, why do you look at the splinter or the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't even acknowledge the plank in your own eye? And he talks about how you need to remove the plank out so that you can see clearly in order to remove someone else's. I see that every day on the internet, people coming along who don't even know you, judging the heart. They do it to me, they do it to others. Judging the heart by some outward appearance that they see perversely because they have a plank in their own eye that they need to deal with. What does that have to do with? Sin. They have a sin in their own heart that causes them to see something perversely or wrongly and then they judge and condemn someone else we are not to judge and condemn others. That is God's job. We are to pray for others. We are to judge only the fruit. Remember that and act in love towards others because I see so much hatred among alleged Christians on the internet. All you're doing is pushing people away. You will be held accountable for every soul that you push away from the Lord because of your hatred and condemnation. My friends, thank you so much for joining me tonight for another campfire coffee chat. I pray this message has blessed you, but I also pray that you will begin to become like a child. Becoming like a child in the Bible is defined as unlearned and uneducated. Give up everything you've been taught. Start from square one like a child as if you're unlearned and uneducated. Pray for the wisdom and the understanding of the Holy Spirit and for the Lord to guide you through his word, and he will. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but he will guide you through it. Give up books, commentaries, teaching guides, and all of those things, and let the Lord teach you and search the scriptures deeply. Be like a Berean. Search it all from start to finish. Do not take scriptures out of context. That is dangerous. But look into it for yourself. You owe it to the Lord your God and you owe it to yourself and your own spiritual heart condition and your own eternity and your loved ones who depend on you to share the truth with them. Because then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.